So uh, today we're, we're delighted to have Brian Chapin, who's from MD Anderson. Brian did his uh, medical school at, at Georgetown and uh, his uh, residency training at MGH. Subsequently did his fellowship at MD Anderson and has, and has stayed on there. And has, he's really a, a thought leader in our field in this area that he's gonna talk about today. That is surgery radiation in the uh, space of advanced disease, uh, oligometastatic disease. So, so Brian, we're delighted to have you today and uh, look forward to learning from you. Yeah, thanks so much. And, and thank you for the invitation. And you know, I, I hope that uh, this creates some discussion and, and we have some time at the end to ask some questions and have some discourse. So um, these are my disclosures, uh, all of them pretty much relevant to what we're talking about today. So on the agenda, I want to talk about prostate cancer disease states. Um, you know, with with I know that a lot of people kind of focus on the oligometastatic state in, in how we treat patients in this disease. And I wanted to make sure that there's a lot of clarity here amongst this group about the different prognoses based on uh, the status of the disease at the time of presentation. Uh, talk about the natural history of metastatic disease. Touch on metastatic metastatic directed therapy. And then uh, talk about local therapy and metastatic prostate cancer with specific attention to the biologic heterogeneity and the prospective clinical trials that have been completed and are ongoing. So for the disease state, you know, when we think about prostate cancer, we think about it, or at least this is how I approach it in most ways, is that there's a castration naive setting where you can have presumed localized disease or you can have clinically apparent metastases that can be nodal or that can be uh, de novo metastatic where you have uh, lymph nodes at the common iliacs or above or any uh, bone or visceral metastases. And we provide local therapies pretty much to the presumed localized prostate cancers and to the clinically node positive prostate cancers. And as you can see with the clinically node positive, we're assuming a non-curable yet treatable state. And as we move up in this column, you can see that their likelihood of cure increases. And then we give therapies. We give these systemic therapies that cause castration resistance at some point, and that can be your first-line scenario, your M0 CRPC scenario, which you know may no longer exist once we have newer advanced imaging. And then you have the you know second line, third line, and so on. And the question of I think all of us is you know we can cure what we can cure, but if we get into the situation where we have micrometastases, biochemically recurrent disease, or clinically visible or apparent disease, can we alter this disease course in any way? And cure, I think, is a big stretch, uh, but, but can we prolong survival? Can we delay time that patients don't need to be on systemic therapy and therefore improve patient outcomes? And I think many people believe that the cat's out of the bag and this is no longer a, a, a time where treating what we can see makes sense. And to some degree, I believe that as well. I think that it's a systemic problem needs a systemic approach, but systemic approaches can be given in combination with uh, directed therapies. And then there's a lot of people who believe that the surgeon or the radiation oncologist or a superhero, they're gonna come by and, and zap a spot or take out the prostate and the patient will miraculously be cured. And I also think that's a bit extreme, but uh, I think it's important to touch on the idea that, that people really truly believe this or at least want this for their patients because patients are in desperation mode when they come in and this, with these diagnoses. And we have to be cautious about what, how we interpret the data that's out there and, and how we apply therapies to patients. Because the reality is there's, these are likely incremental changes at best. Um, you know, this is from the, uh, the, the, the recent uh, boat that got stuck. And basically, you can see here that this, this bulldozer is not going to provide much of a, uh, assistance to the, the movement of the ship. And so I think when I, when I talk to especially trainees, you know, I, I try to focus on the idea of uh, that urologic oncologists really have a significant role in how we treat patients in the biochemically recurrent and the metastatic setting. In a lot of ways, depending on what type of a practice setup you're in, you're going to be the primary person that your patients go to, rely on. Even when they're seeing additional therapy, additional physicians for additional therapy, they come back to you asking your advice and your recommendations because for the most part, you've probably been uh, along their side since the beginning. And I think it's really important when we do that is that we provide full transparency. We have to explain that there's a lack of prospective data in a lot of these areas. Uh, there's confounded results from the retrospective data that exists. We have a lot of unknowns of whether these applied therapies are going to work in addition to those risks that they imply with 
you know, radiating a, a, a site in the lung or radiating the prostate or doing surgery on the prostate. We have to discuss the likelihood of successes because I think a lot of patients show up in our offices and you talk about these treatments and they think it's still with the intent to cure. And you have to almost repeat yourself over and over again that this is a approach towards the overall treatment, but this is not necessarily going to provide a cure. And so therefore define your successes, define what success looks like so patients understand whether or not uh, we're hitting those, those benchmarks. Obviously the treatments that we apply can change the quality of life uh, for a patient. I think it's important that they understand what, what that's gonna result in. And then obviously in this setting, there's a number of clinical trials. And I think the role of clinical trials and explaining to patients why we're doing this, how it's going to affect our understanding of the disease, and how it's going to affect the treatment for, uh, for men in the future. And I think patients are often very willing to take part in trials just based on the idea that they might be helping someone else down the line. So I think to understand the impacts of what we're talking about doing here, you have to have an understanding of the natural history of prostate cancer. You have to know the differences between outcomes in nodal metastatic versus retroperitoneal, uh, clinically nodal pelvic metastatic versus retroperitoneal metastatic versus those that are bone or visceral. Understand that there's recurrent metastatic, so prior local therapy, and then years down the road, patients present with biochemical recurrence and or um, new metastatic disease. The idea of high volume and low volume, and, and you know these are somewhat different than high risk and low risk. And there's a lot of different terminology out there. We just want to touch on some of that. And then obviously nowadays we're dealing with the diagnostics, the conventional imaging versus novel PET imaging, and now trying to understand um, with novel PET imaging, what are those findings meaning for us? And then more importantly and more excitingly, I think is the idea that we're starting to develop molecular markers where we can identify more aggressive nature of, of a prostate cancer disease. So for the natural history, I mean, this is a good example of basically just giving you an idea of what the risk hazard ratio is for uh, cancer specific mortality based on the presentation at the time of metast uh, metastatic uh, presentation. So This is M1A, the exclusively lymph node being the referent, and then M1B with the addition of lymph nodes increasing your risk by 60%, uh, 80%, and then visceral obviously being uh, the, the worst prognosis. And I think it's critical that we understand this and the general idea of this, because when we read retrospective studies, specifically on the topic of local therapy, we often will see that a patient was given, uh, a patient with metastatic disease to the liver was put into a cohort that did not receive local therapy, where the M1A patient received local therapy. And then the comparison shows that the one who had local therapy did better. The reality is, is, is that real or is that just because of the, the selection process that we do as, as surgeons? I think the stage of our metastatic disease, as I mentioned already with some of the newer imaging modalities, is really just a product of that imaging capability. So this is the same patient at the same time point with the same, um, uh, with uh, three different uh, imaging techniques. You have the, the bone scan, the sodium fluoride PET, and a PSMA PET. And clearly you could see that someone who originally would have been considered maybe low volume or at least on the lower end of metastatic disease uh, can have quite substantial volume of metastases when we have better imaging to detect that. And we see that in like, the, uh, the, the state using the, the PSMA studies for staging and high risk prostate cancer. So this is the pro PSMA study, which came out of Australia, where they looked at PSMA versus conventional imaging for high risk prostate cancer. So this is non known metastatic patients. These are just localized high risk patients. 300 patients looking at any metastasis detected being 23% in the PSMA versus 7% in the conventional imaging. And so that raises questions of now, are these patients oligometastatic? Do we need to have a new terminology for patients where a pet identified lesions? Do all these lesions actually represent disease? And then the question of, do we now continue with our idea, our plans for local therapy, or do we abort that and just go to the approach of systemic treatment now, because we now have this new finding. I think uh, often overlooked in this setting by many is the idea that PSA response at seven months of therapy is prognostic. This is a very uh, well-known study from Maha Hussein and JCO in 2006, where they looked at induction of ADT between six and seven months of an induction period of ADT. And based on that PSA response, the patients could be separated into three categories. The PSA undetectable or less than 0.2 patients had a median survival of 75 months, where those that had a PSA 
that was still above four after their induction period had a median survival of 13 months. So I think it's really, again, important to understand what the population is that we're looking at. There's a study that came out of Germany where they looked at patients who received ADT, and if the PSA went to below one, those patients had a prostatectomy. If it stayed above one, those patients stayed on systemic therapy alone, compared the two, and then said, look, those who had local therapy did better. Well, of course they did, because we selected for that population that was going to have a better prognosis from the start. This is a little bit busy, but I want you to just point you to what's in the square, red squares here. This is from the, the um, charted uh, study, basically looking at the comparison of high volume de novo to low volume de novo. So a, a topic of consideration for how do you separate out these populations of patients with newly diagnosed metastatic disease uh, and a little bit of a point of controversy later when we talk about the therapies. So high volume de novo, median overall survival of 48 months, low volume de novo, median survival of 58 months. So those patients who just had low volume disease had 10 month better median overall survival. Now, this again is de novo untreated primary, but if you look at those who had prior local therapy, high volume and low volume, not as much, not as much difference there because now we're, not, we're talking about patients who had recurrent disease after prior local treatment, only about a, a two to three month uh, survival difference, uh, median survival difference in those two groups. So again, understanding the population of interest, understanding the natural history of those populations are quite important when we're analyzing and, and looking at the data that's available and presented to us and having an understanding of the impact of our treatments. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about oligometastatic prostate cancer. And uh, I put the term oligo in, in parentheses there because really this is all metastatic prostate cancer in my mind, but in reality, uh, we're back to that kind of high volume, low volume separation, which probably does have some association with significant biology. So more aggressive biology tends to be found in the more high volume cancers and more, um, uh, I would say, um, uh, better responding biology is found in the low volume cancers, but it's not always true. The, there's a percentage there and it's, it's just an association with the volume. So oligometastatic disease was this concept that was proposed in 1995 by Hellman and Weichelbaum. Uh, it's the idea that patients with limited number of metastases have a state between where they're localized and widespread, and it's the early time at which metastases first develop. And there's also some ideas that there are distinct genomic profiles that are uh, present versus those who have widely disseminated prostate cancer. And when you think about oligometastatic disease, we're back to the idea where you can have synchronous oligometastasis, so an untreated primary with metastatic sites in small volume or you can have metachronous oligometastases where you've had a controlled primary, but still low volume recurrence, or you can have this idea of, of uh, oligometastatic progression where you have maybe a controlled or uncontrolled primary and some metastatic sites where only certain sites begin to progress, but other sites are still uh, responding to therapy. And so there's this, this concept came out and, and you know, there's been a lot of discussion about it and there's really nice editorial in Platinum, uh, in Platinum Urology, in, sorry, European Urology in the, in the Platinum Opinion by Declan Murphy, talking about the idea of this Pokemon phenomenon. And you know, I'm playing a, uh, one of these um, whack-a-mole games here at, at the carnival, but essentially the idea, of it, do we have to actually chase after these metastases? What, is the, what are the patients dying from? Uh, what are the where are the progressive sites and and really is this actually something that's real or something that we've created that we're now providing therapies for? Well, there's some biologic basis to the concepts, and this is a autopsy series where they took patients who had um, died of prostate cancer and looking through their metastatic sites, were able to look at the clonality of their tumors and identify where they were from. So they were what what this showed was that there are actually uh, tumor clones that travel between metastatic sites, in addition to uh, tumor clones that come from the primary to metastatic sites. And there's this idea that these metastases are actually more closely related than the metastatic uh, site is to the primary. And so the concept of can you disrupt this by either treating the metastatic sites or even treating the primary and therefore decreasing the shed of disease and the continued spread of the disease. Well, there's two randomized phase two trials, and the importance of phase two trials is phase two trials are hypothesis generating to help us develop signals of effect and then take that forward and apply it to a phase three study design so that we can actually alter the standard of care. These studies are not meant to alter the standard of care, although I think many radiation oncologists refer to these studies when they talk about 
uh, doing metastasis directed therapy. So I think it's important as urologists that you understand what this actually looks like. And so there's the STOMP study, uh, which was done by Pete Ost, and there was the Baltimore Oral study by Fu Tran. Uh, very similar studies. The STOMP was largely C11 choline detected lesions. The Baltimore Oral was largely PSMA detected, uh, PET detected lesions. And what you can see here is they did surveillance, which was really no therapy whatsoever versus metastasis directed therapy uh, to the metastatic sites in patients with low volume metastases or oligometastatic disease. And you can see the separation of the curves here. You, you can see that there is um, this, the group that had metastasis-directed therapy had a delay in time to treatment um, as far as biochemical progression was concerned. But in reality, when you look at this, by 24 months, 80% of the patients in the STOMP study have recurred. Now, maybe there's a signal of better effect in the PSMA because we're detecting more lesions and therefore providing more therapy or even selecting out a better population of patients to, to, under, to be undergoing this treatment. Uh, but still, these basically show, okay, there's a signal here. Now we need to evaluate this in a larger study in a phase three design with, an, with a meaningful endpoint point other than just progression-free survival. And in fact, um, radiographic progression-free survival is suggested by many for this population, but I think in the end, overall survival trumps all. So it might be important to, to think about that when we, when we look at these types of studies. The other study that a lot of times the radiation oncologists will discuss with patients and also um, argue when we talk about whether or not these therapies are warranted is the Sabre Comet study. And this is also a phase two study, which was looking at metastasis directed therapy in a one to two randomization, it was only 100 patients, so 33 in the control and 66 in the SABRE group. And this was a, a basket study. So there was patients with uh, multiple different primary tumors. Some of them are listed here on the right. Um, I boxed out prostate so that you understand that 6% of the control group was prostate, while 21% of the SABRE group was prostate. And similarly with colorectal, 27% were control and 14% were in the SABRE group. So already there's some distribution bias existing here, which is basically selecting for the more likely uh, survival patients to be in the SABRE group and the ones with the lower survival to be in the control group. And so when you look at that, when you look at the overall survival outcome, um, this did not meet statistical significance, hazard ratio 0 0.57, but you do see separation here and I can understand that. And when you look at progression-free survival, it did meet statistical significance with separation of the arms. Now, the, again, the difficulty in my mind when I look at this is that that distribution bias created a hazard ratio of 0 0.8 before any treatments were even allocated. So it's really hard to look at this and say, you know, this is practice changing and we should be applying these saber directed therapies to metastatic sites in a low volume population. Um, and then, you know, if there was no trade-off for it, then it would be reasonable. But if when you look at the number of grade two adverse events being three times what they were in the control group in the saber arm, and three out of 66 patients died uh, out of direct toxicity from the saber uh, treatment. Now, this was again, a large group of mixed population and the ones that were deaths seemed to be related to um, lung or cardiac toxicity due to the exposure from the radiation when they were doing the saber to a lung um, metastases, but still, these things are not without their, their own harm. And so we have to be cautious and make sure we're actually doing something that's gonna benefit patients. So local therapy in the metastatic uh, situation, when we think about um, why would we do this? I mean, what's the rationale behind local therapy in the setting of metastatic prostate cancer? And I think many of you are probably aware of some of the, the earlier studies, the, the CULP study, the ANGLE study, the Rustoven study in, in European urology and in JCO, uh, which looked at population-based data sets and basically identified patients in SEER or in um, the NCDB where they had a diagnosis of metastatic disease and then underwent subsequent treatment to the primary, uh, either with surgery or radiation therapy, and basically those who had local therapy had a better outcome than those that did not. And again, now, the, no matter what you do statistically to try to account for the differences in these populations, you try to match patients, you try to uh, perform statistical analyses to make things even, you really can't overcome the selection bias that exists in, in, in this type of a, a situation. But those differences were, were pretty extreme. And so therefore people said, well, if, the, if it's showing that there's a 
30% difference in survival. Maybe there is only a 15% difference in survival, but maybe that's worth investigating. And so this is when uh, trials started to become um, uh, more active in the space. We do know that in men who have metastatic disease and progressive metastatic disease who've had prior local therapy, not necessarily during their metastatic presentation, but, but before when it was presumed localized, those men seem to have less local symptomatic progression than men who have a de novo untreated primary tumor uh, as they progress in their disease state. And, and that number of, of men that present with urinary retention, hematuria, issues that can, that can cause uh, really issues with their quality of life, in, uh, need for hospitalizations, significant medical uh, costs, um, can be as high as 25 to even 50%, depending on, on some of the, uh, the, um, the, the publications that are out there. And so that's things like stenting and terps and all those things that have to come up if patients have trouble. And I'm sure the residents you know, that are here have been in the, in the ER dealing with some of these patients with, uh, with needing bladder irrigations and uh, having issues with hydronephrosis and renal failure. The other, um, one of the more biologically relevant findings is that we know that molecularly lethal prostate cancer still persists in the primer even after you've given aggressive systemic therapy. This is from a study where we did at MD Anderson, where after a year of giving ADT plus docetaxel-based chemotherapy, we did a prostatectomy on patients with high-risk localized prostate cancer or node-positive prostate cancer. Uh, I think 90% of these patients had node-positive prostate cancer. And when we took out the primary and, and, and evaluated, analyzed those tissues, we found there was a significant amount of tumor le left, viable tumor left, and that tumor was not just viable, but also had upregulation in a lot of the pathways uh, that are involved in um, epithelial to mesenchymal transition and, and also preclinically uh, linked to prostate cancer lethality. So increased alterations in uh, P10, P53, uh, RB, things of those nature. And then now we get to these more, more theoretical things. So systemic tumor biology may be altered, and that goes back to that metastasis um, to metastasis spread that I showed you earlier, the Gundam study from the autopsy series, where the systemic tumor biology, if you're disrupting the cycle or the exchange of tumor cells between the primary and the metastases, that it may actually decrease the spread of the disease. It may limit the ability for the cancer cells to continue to be augmented by the primary tumor. And so that interrupting these can, can actually impact the patient's long-term outcome. Those are mostly theoretical. Some of them are based off of preclinical mouse models. A lot of the literature is in breast cancer, not in prostate cancer. Um, we, at uh, my uh, program, we had a fellow a couple years ago, we tried to do some mouse models for uh, cytoreduction and, and had uh, significant issues with trying to perform that and were unable to successfully do that. Um, largely because some of the most of the prostate tumors that will grow rapidly overcome and, and the, the, the animal dies very quickly, where the ones that tend to grow more slowly, you're talking years in order to actually get these things to metastasize if, if they do at all. Um, and then we know that at, at this point that randomized trials are feasible and local treatments are fairly safe. I mean, we've had lots of prospective single arm studies or even retrospective reviews of, of patients who've had metastatic disease and have undergone a treatment to their primary with surgery or radiation. And then we have those, uh, that safety data. And basically the outcomes are not much different than what you'd expect with a locally advanced primary uh, with a you know, clinical T3A or B primary that you're undergoing uh, treatment in a high risk setting. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that there's data against this concept. And, you know, part of this is everyone just assumes that because I, I, I've been investigating this and my studies are focused in this, that I believe that it's the right thing to do. Uh, I get calls all the time saying, you know, I don't have the trial, but this is the right thing to do, right? I should take out this man's prostate. And the reality of it is, is, you know, we don't know. And we do the, the work to try to answer the question. And I think you have to come into it with some idea that there's equipoise and we don't actually know the answer. And studies like this show me that, you know, we could be wrong and that there's any signal of effect with this type of treatment. This was a um, study in Germany where one site uh, of 40 patients, the, the standard at their center was to do best systemic therapy. At the other site, they did best systemic therapy, plus everybody got a cytoreductive prostatectomy. So there was no selection. It was just the approach. 
Um, and so when you look at the comparison of these two, uh, of these two centers that were uh, contemporary comparisons, you essentially see here that months to CRPC on the left are no different and months to death on the right are no different. So clearly there's some evidence that maybe this is not gonna benefit our patients and therefore why put them through uh, an operation if need be, if, you, if they don't need it. So talking about biologic heterogeneity and talking about um, understanding this disease better in this setting, I think that, you know, one of the, the things I always talk to my trainees about is, you know, you do a clinical trial to answer a clinical question, but really you do a clinical trial because you also want to learn more about the disease. And if you don't have the next step in your plan already in place, you need to think long and hard about how you're going to come up with the next step. And also how are you going to analyze these tissues? How are you going to collect them properly so that you actually can analyze them uh, to get a better understanding of the disease? And, and really what we all want to do is try to do a better job at not just prognosticating, but predicting response to therapies. So when, we, when I first started this um, in 2011 was when I wrote my first randomized phase two. And um, we sat down and we were talking about the concept of oligometastatic disease and about polymetastatic disease, visceral metastases. You know, what do we know about how to prognosticate for these patients? And most people were saying, yeah, we should do this in oligometastatic. We should do it in those who have PSAs that become undetectable. We shouldn't do it in the visceral metastases, you know, not just liver, but also lung. We shouldn't do it in the polymetastatic patients. But I think that's just us making our assumptions and thinking we know more than, than the average person here, and, and we don't. And so when we first started, we wanted to not have a biased approach. We wanted to have an unbiased approach. And so but at the same time, we're, you know, we were not foolish enough to think that we should be doing this in everybody. And so we basically made an ag agreement that if patients were responding to the initial therapy and no evidence of progression, if they had six bone metastases, they were still eligible. If they had a lung metastases and it responded, they were still eligible. So we didn't want to limit based on volume of disease. We wanted to look more at the biology and create this filter um, that was able to select out the bad biologies. And so in doing so, we created a randomized phase two study of best systemic therapy with or without definitive treatment of the primary tumor. And the definitive treatment could be radiation or surgery. Patients were screened if they had metastatic untreated primaries. Um, given best systemic therapy, which in 2012, when this started, was effectively ADT alone and, and later became the option of maybe adding docetaxel. If patients progressed to castrate-resistant progression, they came off study. They did not get randomized. If they were randomized, which 119 patients were, they were stratified by their PSA nadir at that time point. So whether or not they were less than or equal to four. Um, and then ultimately at their site of enrollment, because we opened this up at three other sites um, at, down the line. Patients were then given uh, continued best systemic therapy with or without definitive treatment or best systemic therapy alone and followed until castrate resistant progression, which was the primary endpoint for this phase two study. And we luckily had a lot of the patients were done here at MD Anderson because we didn't open it up to the other sites till later in the, in the course of the trial. Um, so we had prostate biopsies from diagnostic specimens. We had blood samples at, at um, presentation for many of these men, and then MRIs at every time point, uh, which allowed us to do a number of correlative studies to uh, better understand uh, what's, what's going on in this disease setting. And our overall hypothesis was that there were biologically distinct subsets of prostate cancer that had unique therapeutic vulnerabilities. And the goal of this was to try to figure out if we could identify those subsets and identify which might benefit most from a local treatment. And a lot of the work that's been done here at MD Anderson by my colleagues in geomedical oncology has been focused around trying to understand disease biology and trying to subset or subclassify these, these patients into different categories. And largely, there's three categories that are currently in existence, at least in, in the framework of how we think about it here at MD Anderson. There's those that are androgen-driven, where they are uniquely responsive to androgen deprivation therapy. These are the ones that are your path CRs and, and, and near CRs after uh, a neoadjuvant treatment. And then there are those androgen in different populations, which are the ones that you know, have big bulky tumors, don't make a lot of PSA, uh, are more likely to metastasize to visceral organs. Uh, and these have, uh, by work done by Anna Aparicio, have been identified clinically at first. And then that clinical group that, that tended to have a, a, a behavior that was similar to even small cell prostate cancer, or the more aggressive types of variant prostate cancer, uh, 
Uh, and then she was able to molecularly identify that as having at least two of the uh, uh, mutations either in P53, P10, or RB. So two of the three uh, had to be present for it to be declared androgen indifferent. And with that work, then they took a population of patients and randomized them to, this is in the CRPC setting, randomized them to receive cabazitaxel versus cabazitaxel on carboplatin. And what they found was, and this is the subset or the subgroup analysis from those who, are, who had the aggressive variant prostate cancer molecular definition, so P53RB or P10 or combination of two, and showed that those patients who received platinum-based chemotherapy had a better survival um, than the uh, patients who received cabazitaxel alone. And when they looked at the population of CRPC men that didn't have the aggressive variant signal, there was no difference with the additional carboplatin. So this is actually the first sign of a potential predictive marker for treatment in CRPC. And this study was published in Lancet Oncology in 2019 and is now uh, going forward as a SWOG phase three uh, to look specifically at um, the aggressive variant uh, signature as a predictive uh, marker. This is the question of this uh, identif identified molecular signature. The question comes up is, does this exist at an earlier time point or is this only induced by our systemic therapy. So meaning, do I give ADT and then this emerges or are patients already destined to be AVPC or aggressive variant at the time of presentation with their de novo metastatic disease? And then there's also a, a study, a phase two PCCTC trial called Cascara, looking at it in the, in the de novo metastatic setting, looking at the addition of carboplatin. Uh, and as I mentioned, the SWOG phase three. So we wanted to figure out whether or not the aggressive variant prostate cancer signature was was present in the hormone sensitive setting. And so we took our samples from our phase two um, randomized study, the 119 patients that we had, and we took both uh, circulating tumor DNA and the pretreatment untreated biopsies from their primary and performed whole exome sequencing on uh, the tumor samples and looked specifically at a group of men who progressed in the first six months. So that was those groups that, that were more likely to develop castrate resistant disease within the first six months of starting therapy. And then compared that to a population of men who had no um, progression. So basically they, for, I think it was at this point, it was 36 months and they had no evidence of, of progression of their disease with again, ADT alone. And what you can see here is that the progressive group on the right here, those who had progression were more likely to have RB, P10, or P53 mutations. So, you know, again, the, the idea that you're um, increasing the likelihood of having more aggressive biology present in those that, that early have an early progression of disease. Um, and they also had a higher number, for the most part, of somatic mutation burden, burden overall. In the no progressing group, we had low levels of no RB, no P10, um, two patients with a P53 and low levels of somatic mutational burden. So basically different biologies based on uh, their, on how they, um, and how they clinically uh, progressed and responded to therapy. And so we took this information as, as our um, preliminary data and, and we're able to uh, get a uh, Prostate Cancer Foundation Challenge Award, which was uh, a nice uh, grant, but we were able to look at the frequency of these molecular subsets in the primary metastatic tumors of the entire cohort from uh, that fa randomized phase two. Also looking at the liquid biopsies, so the circulating tumor DNA, and then looking at the associations of the outcome of these subsets and the effect of local therapy. Um, this is work that's been ongoing, and I can tell you that you know, in the samples that we've already evaluated, you can see here, um, the yellow represents a mutated sample, so P53 mutations, RB mutations, and P10 mutations. Again, this is untreated tissue, so this is not uh, induced abnormalities. And then looking at the entire cohort that had all valuable samples, 30% um, of the patients had that aggressive variant prostate cancer signature. And when we looked at this with disease outcome, overall survival, the blue represents those that do not have aggressive variant prostate cancer signature, and the red dotted line represents those that did have the aggressive prostate cancer signature, whether it be at the time of presentation, or even if they had it at the six-month time point when we gave, uh, we did another biopsy right prior to the randomization. So this is clearly a prognostic marker in the metastatic castration-sensitive um, population, and so 
now we're looking at the uh, evaluation of whether or not this is correlated with local therapy and whether or not it's a it's it's potentially a predictive marker for uh, local therapy treatments. So I, I think overall what we're trying to do is we're trying to come up with better therapy for everyone, right? We want to take a patient who has new prostate cancer, whether this is you know, localized intermediate risk disease or newly diagnosed metastatic disease. We want to look at those clinical features, which we already do. We're starting to look at genetics. We've been looking at some commercially available genomics. And then one of the things that I actually have an interest in from a neoadjuvant standpoint is our induced responses and whether or not the response can predict whether additional therapy is, is necessary or warranted. And then we want to personalize care and, and try to provide the best therapy for an individual patient, whether that be just systemics alone, um, even immunotherapy, chemotherapies, or whether we add local treatments. So I'm going to spend the remaining um, time here talking about the prospective clinical trials. Uh, and then once I'm finished, we can open up for any discussion. Um, there are three existing uh, prospective randomized trials looking at metastatic patients newly diagnosed with, when, with receipt of systemic therapy plus or minus radiation treatment to the primary. So the HORAD and the STAMPEDE studies have been completed. HORAD was started out as a high risk, high volume patient. They had to have greater than five bone mets to get in originally. And then that opened up later as they had trouble with accrual. But this was with uh, ADT alone. STAMPEDE RMH was basically um, uh, all, all comers and um, it um, basically was ADT for the majority of patients. Uh, and I think about 16 or 18 percent, something somewhere in there, had received docetaxel as part of their systemic approach. Piece one is a study that has completed its enrollment and uh, it had randomized patients to receive hormone therapy uh, with or without abiraterone therapy, um, with or without radiation to the primary. Um, and so that is maturing and hopefully we'll have some more data from them shortly. The outcomes of the HORAD and the STAMPEDE, the overall survival between the two groups, ADT or ADT plus RT in the HORAD study was no different. Entire cohort for the STAMPEDE RMH control and radiotherapy, no different. Um, the STAMPEDE RMH study did do an overall survival in a uh, pre-planned subgroup analysis in the low metastatic burden population. And in these patients, uh, there was a separation of the curve and it showed a hazard ratio of 0 0.68, which was the equivalent of about a 3.6 month survival advantage in the radiotherapy group. From a surgical standpoint, we have, as I mentioned, the phase two study that we've done here at MD Anderson, which was surgery or radiation. There was a study called GRAMP out of Germany, which was looking at patients with low volume, uh, limited skeletal metastasis. And as is a, a study called Trombone that was done in the UK. And these patients were randomized to receive ADT with or without prostatectomy and then looking at a survival outcome. Um, the GRAMP study has closed um, early and uh, partly as a result of the Stampede RMH making uh, these study investigators feel that radiation now was gonna be their approach towards uh, primary uh, local treatment of metastatic disease. And the trombone study uh, completed its 50 patient enrollment, and we await uh, the analysis of that data. There's a phase two, three uh, called SIMCAP, which is Isaac Kim out of Rutgers. They're doing um, M1A or B. Patients are randomized to uh, undergo ADT followed by surgery versus ADT plus or minus docetaxel. After surgery, they can add docetaxel. And then looking at uh, failure free survival at two years as well as complication rates um, and cancer-specific survival. If there is a signal of effect after their initial evaluation, then they're going to expand it to a phase three with an overall survival endpoint. And then finally, SWOG-1802, which I'm gonna move on to the next slide to go over in, in a little more detail. Uh, I apologize that this is uh, incorrect and I can show you the next slide where we're at now, but um, this is castration sensitive prostate cancer, very similar to our phase two study, except some slight differences. Patients receive standard systemic therapy. Standard systemic therapy is identified as NCCN guideline based treatment. And what I like about that, I think it's a smart design because it allows you to change therapies over time and not have to change the study. So as apalutamide became available, enzalutamide became available, abiraterone became available in this, in this disease state, this allows patients to go on those therapies 
And then what we do is when we, we stratify patients for whether or not they received an AR actual chemotherapy so that we have uh, at least balance of the arms. Patients are then randomized between 22 and 28 weeks. And at that point, they are random, randomly selected to undergo sy standard systemic therapy with or without definitive treatment, and that could be surgery or radiation. The radiation in this um, is limited because we do have, as I mentioned, those other radiation studies that have already been completed. So the radiation is capped out at one third of the total patients that are being randomized. Uh, once that's met, then, then it will be uh, surgery only. And that allows us um, from statistically and, and from a number uh, standpoint to be able to evaluate the role of surgery alone um, with uh, as a secondary endpoint. Patients then continue on their standard systemic therapy until uh, progression. Progression is defined by prostate cancer working group two criteria. And then uh, patients can go on to any additional therapies that they normally would be eligible for uh, with an overall survival endpoint. Um, patients are allowed to receive metastasis directed therapy if they have oligometastatic, so uh, less than or equal to four bone mets. They're allowed to receive metastasis directed therapy as long as it's completed prior to randomization because it is a stratification factor. So that way, again, we balance both arms in this secondary endpoint, we can look at metastasis directed therapy. So this is our most recent um, update. We basically, for the sites that are enrolling, we send updates every month. As you can see, during uh, COVID, we took a little bit of a hit last year, uh, but we've actually started to improve dramatically over the past several months as we've gotten some sites on board that, that had a little bit of a delay in getting started. And so we're finally, the yellow line represents what our estimated accrual is monthly, and we're finally exceeding that. So we're excited about that. We have um, 362 of our planned 1,273 patients enrolled. And so lots of room left for, for sites that are involved. I know you guys are enrolling, so thank you for doing that. And, um, and then exciting news that we recently got a, a R01 grant uh, in February for, uh, awarded in February for uh, looking at the samples from the SWOG 1802 study, we're collecting um, liquid biopsies from patients at the time of enrollment if they're untreated, um, ideally, but if they're already on therapy, we're collecting them as well. And looking specifically in this grant at the um, CTC count, um, there was a recent publication based off of SWOG 1216, which was the uh, TAC 700 um, uh, ADT plus or minus TAC 700 in, in hormone sensitive metastatic prostate cancer showing that CTC count was a prognostic variable for patient outcome and survival uh, in the hormone sensitive setting. And so we're looking specifically at CTC count, um, whether or not ARV7 is present. In addition to looking exploratorily, uh, looking at uh, molecular features and, and targeted sequencing. And then also looking at radiomics, so um, kind of the artificial intelligence of imaging and identifying the changes in the evolution over time as we're seeing these patients in subsequent follow-ups with imaging. So we're, we're able to look and see if their um, imaging is able to help us identify how patients will respond in their outcomes. And then obviously a, a, a compilation of both as, as the third aim. So we're excited about that. Uh, Amir Goldcorn at USC is the is the primary PI on that and, and has the rest of our team here involved with this. So I'm going to um, finish up here and um, just say that, you know, based on, on new imaging studies, we have stages that's migrating and this is creating new questions now in this locally advanced population. We have metastasis directed therapy, which is being investigated and sometimes even assimilated into practice. And I think, again, understanding that data is important for us when we have discussions about this with patients and with our colleagues in radiation oncology. Um, in my opinion, outside of pa strict palliation, cytoreductive surgery really shouldn't be offered off trial because we don't have sufficient data to suggest that this is a, a benefit to patients. And there's clearly some uh, quality of life effects of having a prostatectomy uh, in the metastatic setting. And uh, as I hope I, I, I focused on there towards the end, I think all of this is that we need to have a better understanding of, of biology and the mechanisms underlying potential benefit of local therapy so we can do a better job of integrating this and selecting patients and trying to find predictive markers for who's gonna benefit because I've been doing this type of treatment on these trials for a long time. And I can tell you that there are patients who I think I truly benefited. And there are patients where they blew right through the operation and, and progressed right immediately after and, and did poorly. 
And, you know, I, I wonder if, if, if there are ways we could have identified that from the start and, and perhaps chosen people that needed it, uh, but, but, you know, avoided it in those that did not. So um, one of my key thoughts for the, the trainees is always try to support clinical trials. These are what are going to make us uh, at least finally have some data to, to either refute or support what we're doing and, and help us to, to do better for our patients. Uh, takes a whole team of people to do this type of work. And so this is all the folks that have been involved with, uh, with the trials, with the correlative studies that we've been doing. Uh, and uh, I wanna obviously thank patients and their families for going on these trials. So I'll, I'll say thank you there, I'll stop. And, and hopefully we have some time for questions or discussion. Brian, that, that was a great talk. This is Doug, sure. Um, I'm wondering if you could share with the group why you feel it's important to pursue these clinical trials looking at cytoreductive prostatectomy in light of the stampede data, why it's still important to, to do a trial looking at surgery. Sure. So I don't, I don't think that we, I mean, there's a couple of, of points I'm going to make. And so um, not one more important than the other, but as I go through this, I mean, it, we don't, no, while we assume that there's equipoise with surgery and radiation as a method of local therapy, we don't know for certain that that same thing exists in the metastatic setting. Um, we don't know if the benefits seen with local therapy in that Stampede RMH study um, will exist in the setting of the newer systemic agents. I mean, that's largely ADT driven. And, and you know, obviously we know that the therapies we have now are better. And so if you're providing someone with ADT and abiraterone or ADT and abalutamide or even ADT docetaxel, you know, do we lose that benefit that might've been seen with a local treatment, um, particularly with a radiation treatment? So I don't think that the question is answered. You know, when we, I mentioned earlier about phase two studies kind of being signal finders looking for uh, how to develop a phase three. I mean, subgroup analyses are the same. They're, they're trying to make sense of the data, but they're not, you know, if this was a, a drug that the FDA had to approve for our use of its, for its, as a treatment, it wouldn't be approved off a of subgroup analysis. And so a 3.6 month improvement in survival in a patient population that largely received ADT, um, where we don't really have full data on their uh, disease volume because all of their um, imaging data was collected retrospectively after the fact, you know, the, it wasn't part of the prospective collection for the study. I, I just find it hard to kind of, you know, just assume that everything's decided and that's the answer and that's where we should be. Um, that's how we should be practicing where every patient with low volume disease gets radiation. Um, yeah, I think that the low volume patients are likely biologically enriched for a more responding group, uh, as I mentioned earlier, but it, it's not all of them. I mean, when I looked at all the early progressing patients from our phase two study that progressed in the first six months, um, only about 60% of them were considered high volume or 65% high volume and 35% were considered low volume. So low volume there still had bad bio biology. So I think it'd be a lot easier to accept if we could identify a disease biology and then figuring out which treatment we should be applying based on biology, not just based on anatomic distribution on a bone scan. I mean, that just seems so, you know, it, it seems like, a, like a, just the it's a bit outdated at this point, or it should be. I, you know, I'm embarrassed it's not. <laughs> um, looking at those aggressive variants that you alluded to earlier with P10, RB, et cetera, are those corroborated on the commercial oncotypes and decipher scores? Is that also in line with the aggressive variants? So um, it's not. We haven't partnered with any of the commercially available uh, genomic companies yet to look at that. Um, we are looking at the 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 signature in the SWOG 1216 data set, um, which is the, the TAC 700 uh, um, study. And, uh, you know, so we'll see in that hormone sensitive setting if it also is prognostic there. And then, you know, ideally in Dr. Aparicio's study for SWOG for phase three, looking at it in the CRPC setting, uh, they're also considering doing a study looking at it in the hormone sensitive setting as a predictive marker for treatment. So. Um, I think that, you know, they're, it's building on itself. And I think that that's, you know, that's, it's a starting point. I wouldn't say that that's even the end point. You know, I wouldn't say that I'm going to put all my money on AVPC, but it's something that now differentiates. And if we can differentiate that further by using, you know, more, a little bit more, when we have more data available, you know, the, the, 
the AVPC signature in the, in the, in the phase two study samples was largely based off of IHC. It wasn't even based off of sequencing data. Um, you know, there, there's, you can sequence the tissue, you can do a, a $10 IHC to find out those things and, and, you know, be able to get quick answers to those questions. Um, it would be interesting to look at it with the commercially available uh, companies, but we haven't done that yet. Thanks. Hey, Brian, uh, it was a great talk. It's uh, Chris Barbieri. How you doing? Good, how are you? Uh, the, um, I, you said it really well when you said, uh, I think like that stage is a function of imaging capability. And like, I'm curious, how do you think about like how we're going to have to reevaluate our staging categories with new advanced imaging? And how do you sort of approach the patient who has nothing detectable on conventional imaging, but something detectable on advanced on PSMA based imaging? Like what clinical category do you tell them they're in and how do you think about how to treat them basically? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, this, has come up um, in a couple ways, right? It, it, it's not typically because I'm ordering a PET scan because it's generally not recommended and it's not part of the guidelines um, for the most part. Now, patients show up here all the time having got an Axiom PET scan as part of their staging study. I don't know how they get insurance to pay for that because we have enough trouble trying to get them to pay for it when it's indicated, but they'll show up with an Axiom PET or they went to you know, so, some place in the middle of Arizona to get a PSMA pet and they show up with that as well. And they did that out of pocket on their own. And so, yeah, we get those situations. And then, I mean, we just took part in the Blue Earth study looking at staging and high risk with PSMA. So it comes up. The difficulty, I think, with a lot of it is, is we're still learning about how well the, the imaging uh, works, right? I mean, there's a lot of false positives, you know, and, and depending on your experience of your radiologist, um, you know, that can be, that could be pretty significant. I mean, these bone, these bone spots that are basically like fibrodysplasia, these, you know, the celiac yeah. nodes showing up and people, celiac uh, ganglia showing up, people calling those nodes. So, I mean, there's that part, but, you know, aside from that, like a true positive lesion that's not seen on conventional imaging to date, I haven't been altering what I would normally offer the patient because I don't, I'm not smarter than, you know, than what's out there. And what's out there is, is that in conventionally imaged patients, a local therapy has an improved outcome compared to no local therapy. So what I, what I will say, and I don't, I can't think of the reference offhand. I have it somewhere, but there was a nice small paper basically looking at patients who had pet positive imaging um, versus pet negative imaging in the local setting had treatment and then looking at their risk of recurrence. And it was like 90% of the people who had pet positive imaging had recurrence um, after they had local therapy. So I, I, I think what I tell patients is, look, you know, you have a, a node that lit up or you have a bone spot that we didn't see on the bone scan that lit up. So chances are that, that your treatment is not going to be a curative treatment. You know, could it be, could you be in that 10% or less? Sure. But chances are it's not, you know, this is part of an, an ongoing kind of approach to treating your, your disease. And, you know, by doing the surgery, by taking all that out, we'll verify if it's real or not. We'll verify the number of nodes. We'll have some more prognostic information. And with that also, um, you know, I think a whole nother topic of discussion and talk about, you know, how do you treat the node positive, pathologic node positive patient post-op? But, you know, I, I tend to be a little bit more aggressive with them. I do tend to give them a period of hormones and, and whole pelvic radiotherapy um, and, you know, so I think that it does alter what we do and it does kind of augment our decision making. So I still think it's it's an important approach. Now, will that change? Possibly. But the problem is, is that imaging is going to be approved before we can even write a study to randomize people to receive it or not. I mean, it's, you know, it's around the corner. Um, so really what we need to do is figure out how do we integrate the, the imaging into our practice and not necessarily have it dictate our practice. And then once we've got an experience with it, we can look back and say, does this make sense or not? And, 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 you know, for the trainees on the call, I mean, when someone tells you that they do an image and it changes your, your treatment 60% of the time, it's not because it's the right thing to do. It's just because when you see something, it creates a reaction. And so, you know, like these studies from like, um, you know, Axiomen, the Blue Earth Company and, and, and the most recent one for the PY, uh, PYL, you know, these studies, change your management 60% of the time, but just because now you're including a node in your radiation field, or you're including a bone spot in your radiation field, you have no idea if that's going to impact the patient. You have no idea if that's the right thing to do. Um, so like 
I, I just have a hard time buying into like, like now we have to do these scans and everybody because we change management 60% of the time. Brian, your comments on CTC counts were very interesting. What's the intra individual variation in those CTC counts and how much do they vary from center to center? So um, what, what Amir has been doing is he's been working with, uh, with one of the companies, I'm drawing a blank on it at the moment, it was on the last slide, but um, specifically looking at, uh, at trying to identify these, these like single cells um, within uh, their, their field. And what he's, what he's, when he's doing counts, what he's been seeing is, you know, if you have a whiff of hormone therapy, um, essentially your, your circulating tumor cell counts drop to essentially zero. Um, so the only time that you can actually identify these is in patients who haven't received any hormone therapy. So your de novo untreated patient walking in the door, um, you can start to see them emerge again at some, in some patients before randomization. And the reality it is that that's probably just an early sign of, um, of castration resistance that we're seeing in that, you know, in a cellular level before we're seeing it actually clinically. Uh, and then obviously, again, when they progress to, to castrate resistant progression, we can see them again. Um, but the, the counts have been fairly low. Uh, his cutoff for that, um, for the 1216 study, I, I think he looked at, I want to say zero to three and greater than three or something like that. I mean, it was, it's different than with the CRPC, they're lower numbers for sure. And um, between centers, I can tell you, we did, we looked at circulating tumor cells at our center um, with one of the labs and had a really difficult time identifying things um, at all in patients that had any hormone therapy. So basically, I think at our zero time point, we had about a third of the patients had circulating tumor cells. At the six month time point, effectively zero patients had circulating tumor cells present. They had circulating tumor DNA, um, but even that um, really low amounts when they're on the hormone therapy. So when they're effectively treated and responding, very little. And again, intra-individual variation? Uh, I don't know that offhand, to be honest with you. I don't know what, what, what the numbers were. So Brian, great talk. I applaud you for uh, being in this space. I think increasingly we see a lot of, uh, you know, obviously the radiation oncologists have been big proponents of these cooperative trials. And, um, you know, I, I see potentially less and less urologists over the course of my career that are doing this. And so can you tell, talk a little bit, you know, to, to the trainees about, um, you know, how you became interested in this space, mentorship that you've gotten to, to figure out downstream outcomes of these uh, incredibly sometimes complex potential outcomes for these trials? Yeah, you know, I, um, I like to say I kind of got lucky and fell into it, but, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, I came to MD Anderson to do kidney cancer research with Chris Wood. Um, I spent, you know, a year in the lab with him looking at hypoxia and, um, and looking at res cellular resistance to, uh, to targeted inhibitors. And um, kind of throughout the course of that, you know, we, we do a lot of didactics here at MD Anderson for the fellows. And so the fellows in the, during, the, during the multidisciplinary meetings, every week this seemed to come up in discussion. You know, why don't, what do we do about this patient with this one bone met? What do we do with this patient who's got this bulky primary tumor and, and positive lymph nodes? And, you know, there was this kind of acceptance here that, you know, we should treat these people as aggressively as possible without having any evidence to support whether or not that made sense. And so I started questioning it as a fellow and um, actually met with Anna Aparicio, who's one of the geomedical oncologists here, who was a assistant professor at the time. And I said, you know, this seems crazy to me. Like there's zero out there. Why are we doing this? And she said, I agree. Let's write a trial. So we sat down and we wrote a trial. And, um, you know, one thing after another, you start getting involved with something like that. I mean, we just finished that study that we wrote in 2011. Um, the patients finished enrollment in 2018 and the data is finally analyzing, being analyzed right now. Like we, like I, I'm actually working on the manuscript today. So, I mean, that's, what, nine years, 10 years? I mean, it's a long time, so it's a commitment. And, but it, always, it doesn't always have to be. I mean, some of these things can be done in shorter order. Um, but I think, generally speaking, you know, you got to kind of not have an acceptance of status quo and not have acceptance of dogma 
and you know really kind of push people to to show data to support what they're doing and if they can't then there's a hole for you to try to fill and, and try to identify what needs to happen to, to do that a lot of the mentorship that i got for this came from you know people even outside of my department i mean my department of course was very supportive colin denny is very supportive chris wood did a lot of the similar work with integrating systemics and in metastatic patients and kidney so had some support there um but you know i reached out to the medical oncology team here who I worked with Anna pretty closely, um, you know, ultimately going through SWOG with Ian Thompson and, and Dan Lynn were huge parts of, of that. And, um, and then, you know, even beyond that, when I was trying to get the phase two expanded, I just kind of, I called up people that I knew that were interested in, you know, Marty Gleave and, um, and, and Matt Kuberberg and, and Mark Smaldone and Fox Chase, and basically said, you know, can you guys open this and contribute? And they did. And, You'd be surprised when you have something that seems like a good idea that people are interested in the outcome from, it's very easy to get people on board. Great. Well, Brian, thanks again. Uh, this was great. And uh, yeah, I, I remember you, me, and Chris were together for probably the last in-person meeting before this whole thing yeah. happened out at that sport <laughs> meeting in uh, Florida. So hopefully we'll, uh, we'll see each other at the AUA. Yeah, sounds good. All right. Take care. Right. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. Bye-bye.